This is the State of Things broadcasting from the American Tobacco Historic District. I'm Frank Stacio. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot and killed less than a month ago, and this week protesters took to the streets in New York and Florida for the Million Hoodie March. They're calling for the arrest of shooter George Zimmerman. Meanwhile, here in North Carolina, the Black Film Festival is honoring a film that revisits a strikingly similar incident. Dar He, the lynching of Emmett Till, tells the story of a 14-year-old black teenager who was murdered for whistling at a white woman in 1955. It is a feature film directed by Rob Underhill and written and acted by Mike Wiley. And Rob and Mike join me in the studio now. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Good to have you here. Thank Thanks you for Frank. having us. So we should start by, I guess we, we really need to retell the story a little bit. Tell us about Emmett Till, the story that Dar He tells. Uh, Dar He tells the story of 14-year-old Emmett Till that uh, went to Mississippi in 1955 to visit his relatives, his cousins, and was killed for whistling at a white woman uh, outside of uh, the Bryant Grocery in Money, Mississippi. And had it not been for the way that trial was conducted, it wouldn't have been much of a story. It would have been an ordinary uh, criminal trial and story. Absolutely. And in fact, if it hadn't been for his mother being so persistent in wanting the public to know about the story, it had not been. It would not have been known. And it was covered, and it did become a national story. We've got a clip from the film. This is Mike Wiley as William Bradford Huey, the journalist from Look Magazine, who covered the case. In December of 1955, nearly six months after the kidnapping, murder, and subsequent trial revolving around the Negro youth, Emmett Till, and his accused killers, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant, Jr., I sat down with the two men that had been hoisted on the shoulders of white supremacy and later shunned by those same friends and neighbors. I questioned the men, not as a journalistic source and not as interrogated witness, but as a southern white man, the southern white men. I knew they did it. That answer was brutally obvious. What this reporter wanted to understand, and what Look Magazine paid $4,000 to print, and what several million Americans plunked down two bits to read and gossip over is, why? That's Mike Wiley in the film Dar He, the lynching of Emmett Till. In that case, he's playing William Bradford Huey, a reporter, but you play 35 other characters in this play that you wrote. Um, what, what, why was that? Show? First of all, tell us why you decided to write this play, to talk about this story. Well, I, I wrote it because it was the anniversary of Emmett Till's uh, death in uh, 2005. It began as a stage play at, uh, at Deep Dish Theater, actually, in the... Um, uh, summer of 2006. I wrote it because I felt that Emmett's memory was uh, being lost. Uh, it, it was his anniversary and very few people were talking about it. And I felt that young people, which is what, what most of my audiences are, I go to a lot of high schools, colleges, and, and um, perform these plays, I felt that they weren't finding out about Emmett Till and it was an important story. And I needed to figure out a way to tell the story in a way that would be um, uh, uh, acceptable to them. And Rob, it, it was originally a stage play. You adapted it for film. What were the challenges there? Well, there's a lot of challenges in that, um, well, first of all, we go back to the point you made of 36 characters. Um, we, Mike plays all 36 that's right. characters. That's right. And that was a big conversation about if we were going to attempt something like that or if we're going to try to cast you know, 36 roles in a conventional theater or in a conventional cinema way. And uh, we came to the decision that we could pull it off with the success of uh, Wolf Call, the short film that preceded it. In that short film, he plays three white Southerners. And it was very effective, and people were convinced that he was playing three, he was three different people. And so with the feature, we decided to go for it. Now that it's done and people have had a chance to review it, we're really uh, happy with the results. You know, it's interesting, though, because in a film you have different expectations. Mm -hmm. You expect a little, well, you know, on stage, it's uh, when you, there's a little you can do. When you're in the room, um, that kind of magic, the fact that one person is playing the characters is part of the magic. In film, we expect something else. We expect something a little more dazzling. And you did this without a lot of uh, makeup, prosthetics, or any of that. Absolutely. And that was another conversation. We wanted to make sure this wasn't some sort of drag show. or We wanted to make sure that his storytelling, him grabbing and becoming the characters, was the main component. Very minimal costume changes, um, just enough to, to, to take you there. And then it was up for his performance, really, to take you into the world of you know suspending the disbelief and really start absorbing the story. 
in fact, Mike, I've seen the film and the play, and there there is to me an added dimension of knowing that one person plays all these characters. And mm-hmm. that is, for me, it's always been this idea that there's a little bit of this in all of us in each of these characters. That's the key. Is that what you had in mind? That's the key. The key is that uh, there is, and not just a little bit, I, I think that uh, by me playing all of the characters, people have the opportunity to uh, not only empathize but see themselves in all of those roles. Uh, when all of the jury and all 12 of me stand up, uh, we see the echoes of all 12 white men that acquitted uh, Roy and J.W. so many years ago. Uh, so by playing all of those roles, people have the opportunity to say, that could be me or that could be my neighbor or that could be my dad. Is that something you had to explore yourself pretty deeply uh, with with what kind of results as an actor having to play people on both sides of this of this story? Absolutely. In creating a character, any character, whether it's a fictional character or whether it's a true life documentary character, the idea is to always seek the truth. Go deep as far as you can and seek the truth, bringing parts of yourself to the role, right? And so... With creating these true life characters, I wanted to do exactly the same. But not only that, I wanted to make sure that they were characters that people could see themselves in. Not just Emmett or Mamie or some of those other characters. I'm talking about Roy Bryant and J.W. I'm talking about some of the most quote-unquote evil characters in the script. I needed people to be able to see themselves in those roles so that they wouldn't shy away or turn their heads and say, oh, that's not me. I don't need to learn from this lesson. Everybody needs to learn from this lesson. Because once it becomes history, once it becomes the story that we know so well, it it easily devolves into melodrama. We can pick sides and then know that we would never do anything like that. And part of directing this was to uh, take Mike's uh, skills to transform into these different people and to encapsulate it so we could visualize that. Is there role. anything that you had to do technically that, that you wouldn't do on the stage in order to make that work for film? Sure. Well, a lot of these scenes, there'll be multiple mics conversing with each other in the same frame. And so we had to design the shot so that when Mike comes in and then the other mic and the other character, they can converse. I had to make sure, and as well as Mike did, that the timing was just right because he's literally playing in his mind what the other character is saying so he can react to that character uh, naturally. And it was, of course, my goal to be watching the monitor at all times to make sure every reaction was genuine. You know, Mike, he's been doing this play for years, and so he's done it in kind of a cinematic style when he first wrote the play. So it was great translating that into a uh, into a cinematic format. Did the did this seem different to you, Mike? Did you learn anything by doing the film that you hadn't noticed in the play, or was it was it uh, radically different for you? I mean, I can imagine as an actor say, "Yeah, I know the part. Let's go, let's go shoot." But then suddenly, as you're doing a film, it turns at a degree, and you see it a different way, or not? Well, I think one of the obvious things is that uh, film is it's more subtle, uh, and so therefore, I had to be a, a a lot more subtle with uh, with portraying each of the characters. But having been doing the, the piece for so long, I think what was more important for me was getting the timing right, making sure that I was timing it in my head, uh, timing the reactions in my head, uh, along with what the other Mike was was saying. So that was probably uh, the most difficult and uh and time-consuming part of, uh, of getting used to playing all the roles. Well, here's Mike again to give you a sense of his range. Uh, Mike is here playing Emma Till's mother, Mamie Till. I look now for his right ear. A little curled up part at the tip of the lobe. It was there that I saw his right ear had been cut in half. The part I was looking for wasn't even there anymore. The back of his head was loose from the front part of his face. It was there I could see light shining through where the bullet left the skull. stop. My strength was depleted. Did they have to shoot him? He had already been dead by then. 
Dear Lord, this was my boy. This was my son. I know the way a mother loves and knows every bit of her child. My only thoughts were of Emmett's last moments. My Emmett must have cried out two names. God and Mama. And no one answered the call. Mike Wiley in the role of Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till, one of 36 characters he plays in the film Dar He, The Lynching of Emmett Till, directed by Rob Underhill. They're both my guests this hour. And so now I have to ask you the resonance of this story and this film with the killing of Trayvon Martin. When I hear that monologue, all I can think about now in the last few weeks, and I've heard it several times in the last few weeks, when I hear that monologue, all I can think about is that 911 call. Excuse me. All I can think about is hearing him yell for help and no one answering the call. Yet again, no one answering the call. And, and it, it makes me angry beyond belief. I wonder, when you did this thing, you, you, you talked about the fact that we were forgetting the story of Emmett Till. It's a historical piece for, on the American scene. You're writing it as a history. And then it's not. It's not. It's 2012. It's not over. No. No, it's not over. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, we have, you know, you think about Sean Bell and you think about Amadou Diallo and you think about, uh, goodness gracious, uh, Emmett Till, of course. You also think about Oscar Grant. You think about all these individuals that were shot, uh, shot unarmed, shot seemingly and more obviously because of their skin color. And then you think about Trayvon Martin, and you think that people want to say, oh, we have a black president. We're in a post-racial society. We are not. We are not in a post-racial society. We have a long way to come. And if Excuse me, I'm getting on a bit of a soapbox here, but if we do not all take a moment to look at this story and look at the obvious racial tones in the story, we will have failed yet another young life. And had it just been an individual who made that mistake, who may have been walking around with those ideas in his mind, it would have been one thing. But to have all of the institutions and law enforcement validate that action absolutely mm-hmm. that that becomes that becomes a sign of an institutional problem and not just an individual who may have been unbalanced which something. obviously is the case in the Emmett Till story in mm-hmm. the uh, the courts in the courts so Rob when you look at the film now I mean do, do, does this film look different to you now in light of in light of the headlines yeah you know you've got a, it's another boy still growing and with dreams and aspirations and that's what we wanted to capture with this we wanted to show like we we're saying the uh, institutions that make it acceptable to have these beliefs at least that people are different and uh, they should not be mixed together or they put under the uh, rug uh, the bad acts of people with their mm. group this just brings the light that's been seven years since mike premiered his play and it's a great time to premiere the film to uh, keep the message alive and expand the public awareness. I just wonder if you feel differently about it, or and I ask you ask you both because again, you you thought you were doing this this film about something that happened a long time ago, um, and now you're looking at it and saying, oh, it's yeah, and I think headline. that I'll let Mike answer for himself, but I think that was what drove me from the beginning with this story is I knew it was something that happened in the world everywhere. Of course, you hear about stories in other countries, but you also hear stories here in America all the time. Uh, I listen to NPR regularly, and you hear about these kind of stories in the news. So we want to do our part to help keep these things from happening by you know building awareness and making people conscious of what's happening. Mike, you're the father of a young child. What does this story do in terms of what you tell that child, how to be safe on the streets in this country that hasn't quite gotten over it? And that's why it makes me so emotional is that I th- I had hoped that I would not have to give him these kinds of warnings one day. I would prayed that I would not have to give him these kinds of warnings one day. But then this happens, you know, a- half a month ago, and now I realize that I still have to give him these warnings. You have a son, and now you have a grandchild. You won't have to give... You never had to give your son that warning. You won't have to give your grandchild that warning. But somehow I have to give my son that warning? I keep replaying the uh, Sweet Honey in the Rock song in my head, We Who Believe in Freedom Shall Not Rest. 
you know, until the killing of a black man, black mother's sons is as important as the killing as white men, we who believe in freedom shall not rest. I cannot stop replaying that in my head, and I know that I will have to play that song for my son one day. And even if you're not a police chief or, uh, you know, on the uh, on the neighborhood watch in your neighborhood, the idea that we're all somehow defenders and somehow complicit in a system that allows this to happen is where we're one of those 30 – we're all of those 36 characters. So examining the role you play, liberal, progressive or not, in supporting and sustaining a system that allows this to happen over and over again without pointing a finger of blame and saying, hold it, <laughs> that didn't go back to me, then, then this keeps going on forever. Right on. Congratulations, Mike. You have won an award. And uh, that's terrific. The North Carolina Black Film Festival Award for Acting Achievement. Mm -hmm. This was uh, in Wilmington? Last night. Last night in Wilmington, uh, the North Carolina uh, Black Film Festival gave me that award for uh, not only Darhi, but uh, the culmination of Darhi and uh, Wolf Call, as well as Empty Space, the two uh, award-winning short films that uh, have played there in years past. The first of many awards to come, no doubt. Thank you. I'm looking for an award for Jade City. Jade well. City. Yeah, it's coming. With my award, it's friend. coming. I'm looking for my award, man. <laughs> Don't mess with the Jade City Pharaoh. Go get it yourself. Bombata. <laughs> um, uh, but what's, what's happening now with the film? Are you, uh, are you going to take it around? Where is it going after this? Sure. Of course, it premiered in L.A. at the uh, Pan-African Film Festival. Uh, it got Best Feature Film at the Charlotte Black Film Festival uh, March 3rd. Uh, the next stops will be um, Cannes, France, and uh, then I'll be off to Berlin uh, for a screening, and we'll actually be in Berlin to uh, help celebrate the uh, screening there. Well, sounds great. So that's going on. And The Parchment Hour that you also wrote, Mike, very successful run at Playmakers. Yeah. Uh, and you have some hopes for that? Take I do. It. Now let's tour around the state through the uh, North Carolina Cartwheels program as well as the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, it is touring around to uh, counties uh, school systems uh, around the state over the course of the next three or so weeks. It sounds great, and and upward and onward with that. Uh, w- let me just ask you one last question: the film. Now that you've you've uh, shown it very recently, what kind of reactions are you getting, Mike? People are wild by it. People are wild by the uh, the editing, the cin- cinematography, and of uh, of course the acting. They're wild by the fact that uh, um, that. They're pulled into it knowing that it's me playing all 36 roles. Uh, At times they say, well, there's some disbelief there. Why I don't know if I'm going to be able to sit through Mm -hmm. one actor playing all of these characters. But more often, more often than not, in fact, I've never heard anyone say that they are not committed to the film from start to finish because each character is so different. And I would think particularly these days in the last couple of weeks, the reaction must have been fairly emotional. Oh, absolutely. These things uh, do come up at the screenings, things like the Trayvon Martin situation. People, of course, want to have discussions about past cases that we never hear about. You hear about them until the story because it's so big, but a lot of people don't hear about thousands of other people that uh, were lynched or uh, experienced racial violence. But that's, of course, what the Emmett Till story is about. And Darhi, the lynching of Emmett Till, that film is about, is uh, telling that story. Rob, Mike, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Rob Underhill, filmmaker, Mike Wiley, and actor and writer. Both are based in Raleigh. To find out more, www.darhemovie.com. Coming up, we'll chat with cellist Layla McCallum. So stay with us on State of Things. Mm-hmm. 